Hello and welcome to a special feature interview here on EHE TV. Today we have Senator Tim Kaine on set with us. Uh, Senator, thank you for being with I us today. I'm glad to be with you. So um, I actually just sat, uh, Senator Tim Kaine was also presenting to some of the public policy and political science students and you kind of shared some of your personal experiences. So we're going to kind of delve into that today um, mm -hmm. about things that we're going to talk about. So um, one of the important things that I think I saw was that you served on every level of government, both uh, local, state, and federal. Yeah. And so um, you've served as a mayor, a city councilman, you've mm -hmm. also served as governor, and now you're a senator. Um, what's the difference between Richmond and Washington? Um, it's a lot more than just 90 miles, I'll tell you <laughs> that. Um, the the local, uh, local politics is how I started, and I really am thankful that's where I started because we would run nonpartisan, so we knew who the Democrats and Republicans were, but that's not really what mattered. Um, it's very tangible. If people can't see, touch, and feel it, they don't believe you did it. So that's important. And finally, it's very accessible. So if people feel like they're cut off from their democracy, they still know where a city councilman lives. They can call you. They can lobby you in a grocery store, et cetera. So I would say local government really was positive because it built good traits of accessibility, bipartisanship, um, and trying to do things tangible, not just things you can talk about that are sound bites. Um, the, the, when I said that Richmond is very, it's more than more than 90 miles from Washington. If you if you work in Washington, Washington is a company town. It's it's all about politics and the federal government. But most people live in communities where that's not the case. That's not what they're thinking about 24/7. Their jobs, their churches, their family, uh, what they're doing in school. And uh, so when I was elected, it would be very easy to be a senator from Virginia, move to Arlington, and just live right there. But I've continued to live in Richmond because I feel like it's I do a better job if I'm kind of grounded in a community where everybody's not thinking mm -hmm. politics 24 hours a day. I feel like I get a little bit of a better reality check on what are issues that matter to people. And that's why I'm actually traveling in southwest Virginia this week, too. We're on a recess. It's important for me to get out in the state and listen to people and hear you know what, what issues they want us to try to tackle. And I think one of the important issues in Southwest Virginia now, especially, and in the state and in the nation, is health care. Absolutely. And uh, that's something you've been very vocal about, and I think something that you're very passionate about. And um, I've actually served uh, with the uh, remote area medical services. Yeah. Um, they do yeah. um, health care. Have you worked over in Wise? Um, I've been at Bristol, Bristol oh, yeah. Motor Speedway. Oh, sure, sure. So um, th I think that's an important issue right now, and Virginia's dealing with the case of do we accept federal money? Um, to, to cover do the Medicaid expansion. To, and so what is, you, you have a lot of opponents on that. What's your response? Yeah, so I, I feel like, you know, part of the Affordable Care Act was, after the Supreme Court ruling, states would have the option to accept Medicaid dollars to expand Medicaid coverage. So working, basically working poor people. These are, these are not people below the poverty level. They are people who are barely above the poverty level, up to about 400% of the poverty level, which would still be very much middle class often have a very difficult time uh, finding health insurance. Mm -hmm. okay. If Virginia accepted the Medicaid expansion for this group of people, the federal government would pay the full cost of it for two years, and then it would go to a 90% share, and the state would have 10%. It would provide coverage to 400,000 Virginians who are either working people or their dependents, spouses and kids. Um, I think we should take it. I, I, like you, you and I both worked at the RAM Clinic, Remote Access Medical. I've worked in Wise County. When you go to this dusty county fairgrounds in Wise, Virginia in July, and you see people that have driven from all over, not just Virginia, but Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee. I've seen license plates from Georgia, Florida, and Oklahoma, and Louisiana there. In the richest nation in the world, they don't have health insurance. They drive for days so that they can line up and wait for a day or two to get seen by a doctor, get some teeth pulled, you know, maybe to get eyeglasses for the first time when they've needed them for 10 years. You realize we can do better, and one way to do better is for uh, people to be covered with Medicaid. Terry Gardner, who runs the RAM program over there, the uh, St. Mary's Health Wagon and RAM do this together, she waved her hand over the crowd one year at WISE and told me if we did Medicaid expansion, two-thirds th two of these people would have medical care. They'd have health insurance. I think we should do it. Now, the, the counter view is we shouldn't do it because it will cost money, but Virginians are already being taxed for this benefit. The, the states that have, are accepting this are getting their tax dollars back. The states that aren't accepting it, we're still being taxed. We're just not getting our tax dollars back. If we accepted it, it would be good for people. It would be good for hospitals, especially in rural Virginia. It would be good for health care providers, especially in rural Virginia. And I, and I hope our legislature will find a path forward with the governor to do it. 
And I think another issue I actually heard um, uh, while well, watched you speak on minimum wage and raising, yep. the, min raising the minimum wage in Virginia. Um, I think when you're advocating for the welfare of people in the state, um, it can also it can be very frustrating to see yeah. those things not follow through. So how how do you feel like this politics is at yeah. play, and how do you think that that should follow through? Minimum wage, we have a history as a nation. What we do is we raise the minimum wage. We don't index to it inflation. So it stays the same even though the price of everything else is going up. But then about seven or eight years later, we raise it again. Now, because it hadn't kept up with inflation, when you raise it, you tend to raise it in a big jump. The current minimum wage is $7.25. If you are in a tipped profession, and that is any profession where you get at least $30 of tips in a month, which isn't a lot of tips, you can be paid $2.13 an hour. And that hasn't paid changed since the early 1990s. So the proposal is to take the minimum wage from $7.25 up to $10.10 in three jumps. In six months, up a third, another six months, up a third. Finally, by 2016, it would go all the way up to $10.10. Similarly, the tipped wage would go up to 70% of the minimum wage over the course of the next three years. I think it would be a very important thing to do. Um, first, the minimum wage has not kept pace with inflation. If we had just taken the minimum wage in 1968, and let it rise with inflation, it would be almost $11 by now. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't kept pace. And second, and this is the one that's more powerful to me, if you work full time in this country for minimum wage with one dependent, you will be beneath the poverty level. I don't think any full time worker should be working full time and be beneath the poverty level. And if you have a dependent, you will be. So if you raise the minimum wage, it affects about 28 million people. And do you know this? I learned this last week. 28 million people will get a raise. Three million Americans will come off food stamps if we raise the minimum wage. Um, I like to promote hard work and reliance rather than reliance on a you know a government program like food stamps. Food stamps is an excellent program for those who need it, but I would rather have somebody work and earn a wage that they can buy their own food with and not need food stamps. And so, it's something that I want to do. My prediction, because you asked, how is it a political thing? My prediction is, the Senate will pass it, but. I think it will be hard for the House to pass it this year. But again, we do it every seven or eight years. If we don't do it this year, we are going to get to it. It might be next year rather than this, but we will likely be voting on this in the Senate within about two weeks, and I suspect that the Senate will pass it. And um, another issue that I want to talk about, it's uh, kind of a mix, I guess, of professional and personal. Mm -hmm. um, you talked in the former meet, or the previous meeting about the um, voting on Syria and being part of yeah. the Armed Forces Committee. And your son is actually in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I resonated with that. I have a brother in the Marine Corps. He's yeah. actually serving Good across the country. Good but um, you said that you had to make some important votes on Syria. And um, being on that Armed Services Committee, you're directly impacted by your son serving. What's that like for you to make those decisions every day? It's, 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 I mean, first it's an honor. I mean, being a Virginian and being on the Armed Services Committee is just a real honor. And um, being in the Senate and being one of two senators who have a child in the military is also a special thing. It's even changed my, my role as a father because um, before when my son was in the military and I wasn't on the Armed Services Committee, I didn't know enough to have a really good conversation <laughs> with him. I could ask him a dumb question. But now that I'm on armed services and I'm deeply into this every day, he and I talk about different things than, the, than we would otherwise, which has been really exciting. And it's been fun. He's going through a really challenging infantry commander training program now. Um, and this is the first year where that program is open to women. And so I'm asking him, so tell me about that. The Marine, all the armed services branches have opened up these combat, previously all male combat billets to women too. Talk about that. How's that working? You know. And so we've had some really good discussions. But, um, but as a member, actually, the vote on Syria was in the Foreign Relations Committee. It's not the Armed Services Committee that cast mm -hmm. the first vote about military action. They put it over in the Diplomatic Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee. And I'm on that committee, too. And when the president came to us in, in August and said, Syria's used chemical weapons against their own people, we ought to be able to use military action to, to stop them from doing it and I want Congress to vote on it. The, the first, and, and it turned out, was the only vote was taken in foreign relations. And I remember thinking, I've cast a lot of votes in my life. I've cast votes as a city councilman and in state politics. And I've, I've even cast a lot of votes as a senator now. But boy, casting a vote about whether or not to use military force is a very different kind of a vote in terms of just kind of the degree of homework that you want to do and the questions you want to ask of others, but also of yourself before you cast them. And then it added a whole different dimension mm -hmm to it knowing that, you know, um, I've got a son in the military. 
Now, there are 1.3 million American families that have kids in the military, so I'm no different than, than a whole lot of people. But it does make you think about it a little bit harder um, when you know that, you know, people that you know and care about, you know, are potentially going to be affected by this vote. Absolutely. Well, I hate that we're out of time, and I, hate, I wish that we could talk about this more, but we just want to thank you from the entire campus for Absolutely. coming and visiting. I'm really happy. I had a great visit. You guys asked good questions of policy and public policy students, and I was really happy to come visit today, so thank you. Thank you, and thank you for tuning in to this feature interview for EHGTV. I'm Olivia Bailey. Have a great day.